Good afternoon. Can you all hear me well? Yes, wonderful. Good afternoon. Um, dear Member States representatives, Excellencies, dear colleagues, uh, dear Jenny, Victor, and the Secretary, uh, Secretary General, dear partners and friends, uh, I would like to welcome you all to today's lecture here at International IDEA, which is something that we have been looking forward to uh, quite some time. Uh, my name is Matthias Jäger, and I have the pleasure of coordinating our new program on climate change and democracy, which forms the context of this new initiative. Uh, today's event kicks off our new Stockholm series of public lectures on climate change and democracy, which is quite a mouthful of a title, uh, I know, but hopefully you will see that every word there matters. Um, it is a new initiative that is a cooperation between Renode Stockholm-based organizations that have a particular interest in climate change and democracy from very different perspectives. And I think that's the enriching experience there. Uh, and I would like to thank all our partners who are supporting this initiative. Uh, first of all, the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung's Nordics office, the Stockholm Environment Institute, Future Earth through its global hub Sweden, the Stockholm Resilience Center, LSU, the National Council of Swedish Children and Youth Organizations, and We Don't Have Time. We are very happy that we were able to gather such a strong and uh, diverse set of partners on the one hand side because I think their contributions will allow us to achieve our goal of informing, inspiring and engaging a broader audience on the interlinkages between climate change and democracy. But also because we felt it was time uh, that we brought together the climate and the democracy communities here in Stockholm in a more systematic way uh, for what I'm sure is going to, going to be a fruitful exchange, mutual learning experience and cooperation. A crucial element of this new uh, lecture series is the format. So we opted for a public lecture because we feel that the issues that we want to discuss here, both uh, regarding their complexity and their importance, really deserve that we give an expert at least 45 minutes of uninterrupted time to develop their ideas, lay out uh, the challenges as they see them, and uh, suggest solutions to these challenges before we then all engage in uh, conversation. Um, we purposefully decided to make this an in-person only event. So we're not streaming this live, although the lecture itself will be recorded and shared afterwards uh, online as a video and in writing as well. All uh, lectures will be followed by a conversation, as you can see here already. Um, and then in the end, we will also have time for questions and comments from the audience. Now, um, one event still doesn't make a series. So what we have in mind for this Stockholm series is to have four events per year uh, to be held here at our uh, headquarters in Stockholm. And we are very happy to announce that the second lecture is already scheduled. I will say a little more about that at the end. But now let me get to today's lecture. We are extremely happy that uh, Jenny King accepted our invitation to come to Stockholm. And to be honest, I think we're really in for a treat today. Uh, I'm at least very much looking forward to uh, what you have to say. Uh, Jenny King is the Director of Climate Research and Policy at the Institute for Strategic Dialogue in London. And among many other things, she has helped found Climate Action Against Disinformation, CAD, which is a coalition of over 50 organizations working to identify, analyze, and counter climate disinformation worldwide. Jenny's area of expertise is at the heart of the issues that we are interested in here when we talk about the interlinkages between climate change and democracy, because informed citizens are crucial for democratic decision-making in every policy area. However, on a topic as complex and contested as climate change, its consequences and how to tackle them, 
Mis- and disinformation can have a particularly harmful effect on forming public opinion and thus influencing actions taken at all levels of society, from individuals to policymaking. This is one of the areas exactly where uh, that Jenny King has worked on a lot in the coming in the last years, and I think she's exceptionally good at showing why and how this matters to democracy. I therefore really cannot think of a better speaker uh, to kick this series off, and I'm very grateful that you're with us today. Please join me in welcoming Jenny King to the podium to deliver the first public lecture in our Stockholm series. Please. Yeah. Hello, everybody. They had to lower the podium considerably in order for me to be able to speak to you, but hopefully everyone can see me, can hear me on this unexpectedly radiantly sunny day. So I have been given around 45 minutes to take you on a journey, and I would ask that you bear with me on that journey because parts of it are going to feel quite bleak and quite overwhelming, but I promise that I will finish us in a place that is a little bit more empowering and uplifting, and that hopefully everybody leaves here, yes, understanding the threat landscape, but also realizing that all is not lost that there are solutions that can tackle this. And I think that that is really important because it's so easy to get quagged down in this kind of mire of toxic information in the online and offline space and to feel helpless. But that is not the goal of today. The goal of today is to go away feeling inspired uh, and hopefully a little bit more informed about this topic. So let's begin with a story. I want everyone to cast their minds back to April 2020. And the world is reeling from news of a pandemic first detected in Wuhan, China. Now, in order to try and deal with the spread of this virus and to curb its very serious public health impacts, the Chinese authorities have imposed a lockdown locally and many other nation states are going to be soon to follow suit. Now, amidst the turmoil of that early period, I'm sure all of you remember how frenetic our information spaces were. The Guardian newspaper, which is a prestigious left-wing outlet in the UK with international reach, publishes an article. And in that article, they argue that the return to normal should not be our goal here. That actually the coronavirus has opened up a gateway for us to implement radical changes to our economic and political and social norms in order to tackle the climate emergency. And their editorial board poses a question, a really confronting question to readers. It says, could the renewed shock of human vulnerability in the face of COVID-19 make way for an increased willingness to face other perils, climate chaos amongst them. Now, the very next day on Twitter, everybody's favorite social media platform, and art, that same article is posted by the director of an infamous fossil fuel funded think tank with a caption that reads, how climate bedwetters hope to translate the coronavirus lockdown into a climate lockdown. Doesn't get much attention, couple of likes, couple of retweets, disappears into the ether of social media. But this director is not undeterred. And over the coming months, he and many of his colleagues are going to continue to seed this very specific language, climate lockdown, across social media platforms and they're waiting for their moment to strike. Cut again to September 2020. And this time, a famed economist named Mariana Mazzucato, who's written a number of award-winning books, publishes a piece in Project Syndicate. Not a particularly well-known outlet, but it happens to have received funding from both the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and George Soros's Open Society Foundation. Now, her piece is titled Avoiding a Climate Lockdown, and it argues, again, that a radical overhaul of our energy systems is going to be needed to avoid these kinds of realities in the future. I want to be clear, she is not celebrating climate lockdowns. She is certainly not advocating for climate lockdowns. She is trying to lay out a policy pathway that is going to be desperately needed if we want to avoid that kind of future. Now, finally, the moment for our fossil fuel lobbyists has arrived. 
In the week following the publication of this article, tweets containing the phrase climate lockdown spiral from 26 to nearly 3,000 in just seven days. And suddenly, the specter of green tyranny is being conjured everywhere and picked up by a much wider range of accounts, not just fossil fuel lobbyists, but influential public figures, celebrities, right-wing media outlets. And often they're doing that in response to other mainstream media or to entities like the World Economic Forum. Now, cut again to July 2021. And by this point, climate lockdown is beginning to spread exactly like the COVID-19 virus. It appears in thousands of social media posts every single day. It has penetrated far-right groups on platforms like Telegram and Aikun. It has also merged with radicalized conspiracy cults like QAnon and the New World Order. And you can see here how many of the posts talking about climate lockdown are also referencing these broader elite plots or overarching conspiracy theories and how often that comes back to one or two entities like the World Economic Forum. By the time you get to December 2023, this language really is endemic and it has become a core trope on discourse related to any environmental topic, whether that is wildfire management or traffic reduction schemes or water pollution, it doesn't matter. When you dig down onto the surface, you will very often find climate lockdown there in some form. It has been mainstreamed by politicians and media from the UK to the US, from Canada to Australia, from Germany to Brazil. And at the same time, it has also metastasized, right? It's evolved during that time. And now it has become claims around things like a great reset. The idea that elites are trying to entirely remake society in order to enslave the general public. And also 15 minute prisons. It has spurred death threats and vandalism of public infrastructure. It has driven people to the streets in physical protest and it has galvanized thousands of, group of people from really quite disparate pockets of society in opposition to climate action. So why am I telling you this particular story? I think that climate lockdown is probably the neatest case study that we have in recent years of how our information ecosystems now work and how climate has been co-opted often deliberately and often cynically into what is often referred to as the culture wars. And I also think that it's a uniquely 21st century fable because it is absolutely reliant on the way that our offline worlds intersect with the internet and the very specific kinds of knowledge sharing and identity expression and community formation that have been enabled by digital platforms. And at a fundamental level, I also think that this case study reveals something about not only the potential for us to achieve a sustainable and a livable future for mankind to tackle the climate crisis, but also about the survival of democracy writ large. And that is the brief that I was given here today is to try and thread the needle between the climate crisis, information integrity and the future of democracy. And if you think about what this story is, in just three years, a catchphrase that was being pushed by fossil fuel lobbyists helped to drive protests that brought anti-vaccine conspiracy theorists, neo-Nazi groups, and right-wing politicians to the streets of one small UK town, town of Oxford. So how do we get here and what happens next? Climate action is an unprecedented test for democracy. It's an easy phrase to say, but what does that actually mean in reality? Well, on the one hand, to meet the scale and the urgency of this challenge, we desperately need a public mandate, right? We need common buy-in on the pathways forward. We need good faith public debate. And we also need to be candid with each other around what the trade-offs of that pathway forward is going to be. What's our risk appetite? What kind of pace 
what kind of scale do we want for our transition? But at the same time, the manner in which we try to deal with climate change will be a reflection of the strength of our political systems. So something like the Paris Agreement, for example, which is often used as synonymous with climate action, right? The biggest multilateral agreement that exists on climate action. That is a grand vision to try and help us achieve a livable future, but it obviously cannot come at the expense of rights and freedoms here and now. And I think for many in the climate sector, this has become a very acute issue in relation to the COP summits because for multiple years in a row now, the presidency has been held by authoritarian or petro dictatorships. Now, for anybody who has ever been to a COP summit, I have been lucky or unlucky enough to attend three now. They are worlds unto themselves. You know, this grand labyrinth that is a mixture of diplomatic negotiating rooms and trade fairs and protest spaces. And it feels quite separate from the world outside. But the reality of the world really does lie just out of sight. And in the last couple of years, that has been a reality of political prisoners, of stifled media, of forced labor and exploitation, and also of the disappeared. And what many people in the climate sector argued, and I don't think we really gave them enough of a platform or enough attention, is if we allow fundamental human rights to be eroded in the race for net zero, can we really call that progress? At the same time, if we, if we pander to a liberalism in order to achieve this grand vision, you know, where are we gonna end up? And also, honestly speaking, can the climate movement have any credibility with the general public if it is willing to sacrifice or treat as collateral damage groups that have traditionally been marginalized and pushed to the fringes of decision-making? And so for me, that is the reason why climate justice and democracy are inextricably bound together. If you try to tackle one and you don't tackle the other, we are going to end up in ruin. And what's so sort of interesting and, and challenging about climate change and climate action is that it's an agenda which it doesn't only endorse, but it actively depends on the principles of big government approaches of multilateralism, of behavioral change, of cooperation, and of adaptation at almost every level of society and really in all aspects of public, private li and private life. That is not true for almost any other public policy area. And so to achieve our goals on climate action, we're going to have to go beyond what's often referred to as safeguarding democracy. I find that language very challenging, safeguarding democracy, to actually revitalizing what democratic practice means and what democratic life looks like. And so then the question is, well, how does that relate to our information space? And what I would say there is that, again, the sort of holistic nature of climate change, the fact that it touches on everything that we can see and everything that we really do in our everyday lives, that makes it incredibly vulnerable to attack. And in the same way that this can be an opportunity for climate communicators, it's also a very big challenge because it can be a symbol of everything that is kind of corrupt and unequal in society. It's very easy to weaponize the issue in that way. And this isn't a problem that only applies to climate by any means. I would say that climate is the victim of a trend that has befallen a number of other policy areas, many of which ISD, my organization, researches. I'm sure that you can think of a few and they will vary by country, but a couple that immediately spring to mind would be migration, um, racial justice, sex and reproductive rights, civil rights. They have all been co-opted into the culture wars. They've all become partisan, politicized topics. But there is something that I think makes climate unique. And this is a question I'm often asked is, does climate disinformation differ from those other areas? And I, do, I think it does in one very key way. And that's that you have with climate a multi-billion dollar disinfo industry or disinfo machine, you might call it, which has been honing its messages and its tactics for over 50 years, colliding in quite dramatic and unexpected ways with this decentralized and scrappy startup, almost entrepreneurial 
digital ecosystem. The other question that I get asked is, why is this happening now? You know, we know that there have been vested interests operating in this space since the 1970s. Why does it feel like things are reaching such a fever pitch and a toxic moment right now, 2024? What I would say is that we know from a vast body of evidence that disinformation thrives in times of crisis. Disinformation actors are opportunistic, just like the fossil fuel lobbyists in my opening story. They are always looking, they're lurking on the sidelines, just waiting for that moment to pounce on the news cycle. And the reality at the moment is that societies are dealing with one, two, three, five, 15 intersecting crises all at once. Economic crises, political crises, social crises. It's a time of immense upheaval and immense turmoil. And I've put a couple on the screen here. This is by no means the only crises, but let's go through these. So first you have COVID-19, the aftershocks of the pandemic, and that has led to spiraling inflation, cost of living crises for almost every society around the world, but also it's had subtler effects that might be more, less visible in public life. So prolonged strains on healthcare systems and also really deep social, psychosocial wounds, right? Effects on the long-term mental well-being of the general public. Second, you have Russia's full-scale inc invasion of Ukraine, and what's not on this slide is also renewed, devastating conflict now between Israel and, and Palestine. And that has had the effect of applying extra strain and pressure on geopolitical alliances, and also compounding issues that we were having in energy supply chains. Then, next, how can any of us ignore the consolidation of wealth amongst a tiny minority and a ever expanding and increasingly visible gap that exists between the haves and the have nots in every major economy. And then what sits under all of this and kind of intersects with all of these crises is a complete whole scale breakdown of trust in institutions. And people often think that that just means government, but it doesn't. It really applies to every traditional and historic pillar of public life, the media, scientific expertise, higher education institutions, they have all been tarnished by this perception that institutions are working against the interests and the benefits of average people. And so if you combine all of these dramatic crises together, you create this perfect petri dish, essentially, fertile soil for disinformation to thrive, but also for it to have much greater impact than it might have done in the past and for actors who were formerly sitting on the fringes of public life to suddenly become a lot more relevant to the mainstream and to be able to engage a much wider audience with their content. With their content. And unfortunately, in a landscape like that, for all of the reasons that I said earlier, climate has become this lightning rod for conspiracism and for sort of exploiting social divisions for financial and for political gain. Now, I am obviously biased. I work for ISD. Mis- and disinformation is uh, the vast majority of what I spend my, my day thinking about. And so I am obviously predisposed to think that this is a critical issue for society. But you don't need to take my word for it, because this has also been flagged by a number of global institutions. In fact, it was the number one challenge highlighted, I think, by the World Economic Forum this year in, in their list of risks for the future. But also in 2022, the IPCC, which is the body that is responsible, the multilateral body that is responsible for kind of marshalling and interpreting and presenting the most comprehensive evidence that we have around climate science to an expert audience. In 2022, they highlighted mis- and disinformation as a direct barrier to action on the climate agenda. And they urge that we respond to that issue as part of wider climate efforts. I just want to quote very quickly from their executive summary, which it's worth noting, this is a document that has to be signed off by every member state in the world. And for anyone who's done international diplomacy, that is no mean feat, right? So the fact that they got this language in at all is very significant. And they said, vested economic and political interests have generated rhetoric and misinformation that undermines climate science and disregards risk and urgency. 
This has driven public misperception of climate risks and polarized public support for climate actions. And they conclude that that has ultimately weakened the consensus and it's extended the timeline for us to make meaningful progress. Okay, everyone take a deep breath because we're now we're about to wade into the details. That is the broad picture of what we are contending with. Simultaneous crises all happening at once, firefighting taking place on every level. But the question we really have to ask is who stands to benefit from this situation? Oh, oh no, I'm jumping ahead. Spoiler alert. Let's go back one. So who stands to gain? I think it's quite easy to have an outdated or relatively narrow conception of this ecosystem and to think that this is just a war of attrition between the strength of democratic systems and the fossil fuel industry, right? The majority of citizens around the world and those who profit from carbon major companies. Those are companies who are estimated to be responsible for around 80% of all global and historic emissions. But I would argue, and I think our, the evidence that we've produced in the last four years would say that that is not an accurate reflection of the current landscape. Maybe that framing would have been relevant in the year 2000, maybe even in 2005, maybe even 2015, but it is no longer the full representation of what is taking place. And that now at this vantage point in 2024, what you can see is that this traditional ecosystem of your climate delayers and your climate deniers, that they are merging with a much wider ecosystem of conspiracist and extremist actors, as well as for-profit disinformers, outrage merchants and far-right political movements. And this is really important. Bear this in mind because it's going to be the seed for the whole of the rest of the next section, is that as that has happened, the number of people, the number of groups or stakeholders who stand to benefit from both creating, but also just from amplifying climate mis and disinformation has exploded, right? And the objectives of the content have also widened. I'm gonna come back to that at the end of the section. So now we, now we finally come to this diagram. We're going to revisit this at various points, so don't worry if you can't take it all in in one go. But we're going to start with the first group that I mentioned, who we can broadly call the stakeholders in the carbon economy. And so these are people who profit at a very basic level from our continued use of fossil fuels, from oil and from coal and from fossil gas. And I say fossil gas very deliberately because you will see that they have tried to rebrand it as natural gas, but it is in fact a fossil fuel. And since the 1970s, these kind of actors have invested very, very heavily. We are talking more money than you could possibly imagine, more money than most nation states will ever possess to professionalize climate disinformation and wider influence campaigns. And they've been honing these very, very key messages around climate science and climate solutions and climate figureheads and then they have been laundering those ideas into the mainstream through this vast network of proxy entities. So it's very, yes, sometimes the fossil fuel companies will do their own advertising and it will be very obvious, but the majority of the time you'll never even realize that it was coming from them because it goes via PR agencies and ad firms or sponsored academics, think tanks, media outlets, pundits, all of these people who are in on the pay book of the fossil fuel industry, but are trying to pr provide a veneer of authenticity and credibility for the general public. And I, again, I think it's the, like the sheer amount of financial and human resource that you have seen invested in this space that distinguishes climate from those other types of disinformation that I mentioned earlier. Now it's been a really hard fought battle and I cannot claim to have been part of that fight because I am relatively new to this space, but I have great admiration for the people who have been. And after countless subpoenas and freedom of information requests and whistleblower testimonies and leaks and sting operations and committed journalism year after year after year, we finally have an evidence base about how coordinated this influence operation has been, right? This is conscious deception. 
And that is why I feel comfortable saying disinformation and not just misinformation, right? There is evidence of intent there. What we know from these disclosures is not just that many companies knew about the devastating impacts of fossil fuels on the environment going all the way back to the 1970s, but they actually commissioned the research themselves. And then they suppressed the findings and spread alternative narratives among the general public to increase the social license and maintain the status quo of their products and services. I don't know how you can get any more willful or deliberate than that, to be honest. And at the same time, they were also lobbying policymakers with claims that were entirely counter to the evidence base that they had hidden within, I guess it wouldn't have been inboxes back then because computers didn't exist, but within filing cabinets and uh, you know, analog documents kept in folders behind the scenes. Now, some battles they did lose, and unfortunately, it was made public what the impacts of fossil fuels were on the environment. And the public has moved a long way in 50 years in the sense that there is a broad based awareness of the problem. And in most populations, there is a strong desire to deal with it in some form. If you look at the Euro barometer data, for example, in, uh, in, in Europe, I think it's over 85% of people say that they believe climate change exists. Uh, and they want governments in some abstract sense to do something about it. But there is an enormous gap between recognition of the problem and meaningful action on that problem. And that is the gap where information warfare is now being consolidated. And I often call that gap the final mile. And so the fossil fuel industry has pivoted its tactics to be less about denialism, you know, saying that it doesn't exist, because they realize that's not really as palatable as it was 20 years ago. And now they are using what are called discourses of delay. So this is just kind of muddying the waters, planting seeds of doubt about what the pathway forward looks like, what a meaningful transition looks like. And I would like to focus on four key pillars, columns of the narrative playbook that they now use. So redirecting responsibility, the not me argument. Oh, sometimes we also call this absolutionism at ISD. And this is the claim that basically climate change exists and it's a massive problem, but it's not our problem for whatever reason. We don't have enough money. We weren't polluting traditionally. Uh, it's China's fault. They, you know, they've expanded too quickly. It's India's fault. They're still using coal. Somebody else fundamentally should deal with this problem. And it's really easy to see how those kinds of narratives would be impactful now because societies are becoming more inward facing, right? We're more nativist, we're more isolationist. We're about protecting our own communities and actually not thinking as much about the wider world, about international cooperation as we might have done beforehand. Number two, pushing non-transformative solutions. This is the bread and butter of fossil fuel industry campaigns. And basically this is the idea that you suggest solutions, but not really solutions that are actually going to force any sort of systemic change. And one really good example of this would be carbon capture and storage. And if you want to know more about this, we put a whole special edition report out last year on COP around how much attention they were paying to pushing CCS is the acronym for carbon capture in, in the international setting. And carbon capture may well be a part of the net zero transition, but at the moment it is being used to weaken and dampen down ambition and targets all around the world, even though if you actually look at the data of all every single carbon capture pilot to date, the results have been very poor. And also, fundamentally, the technology just does not exist at the scale that would be needed to tackle the scale of the crisis. So not me and not like this. Number three is emphasizing the downsides. Again, this could not have more emotional resonance. This is the claim that net zero is too expensive. It's too difficult. It's such a hassle. We're going to have to change things that we like about our lives. They're going to take away all of the things that you love to do. You're not going to be able to fly. You're not going to be able to eat meat, right? It's incompatible with the way that we want to live our lives. And it just sits at odds with local tradition and culture. 
You also see the flip side of this argument, which is the claim really that fossil fuels are essential to human flourishing is the, uh, the language that is often used. And that's especially relevant to areas of the global south. So what you will see is fossil fuel lobbyists mounting a defense of oil and coal and gas using the language of human rights and saying we are the people who want to see economic development in majority population countries. And it's the climate movement that it sits against that agenda and wants to keep people in poverty and in destitution. Even though the reality is that global majority countries are already experiencing the worst brunts of climate change and the hits that they are taking to their GDP in some places is already reaching the billions per year. And the final argument, it's too late. It's time to surrender. It's an appeal to doomism. It's an appeal to the bit that I think really sits at the heart of anybody who cares about climate change or anybody who's paying attention to the world at all, which is that we've just left things too late. Our systems are incapable of change. We're too entrenched in our behaviors. Let's just enjoy life and wait for the climate apocalypse to come. So these are the sort of four horsemen of the fossil fuel apocalypse, you can call it. But they're not just updating their messages. They're also updating their tactics because we're not living in an analog world anymore. Not everyone is reading newspapers. Not everybody is looking at advertising. You also need to be, be fresh. You need to be interacting with social media audiences. And so they are adapting their aesthetics and their framing for that social media reality. And to take a couple of examples, you know, they're using language that is quite clickbaity so that people engage or click. They're also copying the, uh, the aesthetics of viral social media accounts, even things like the color palettes, using green screen on TikTok, you know, all of the things that your top influencers would be doing. And they are actually working directly with influencers in order to try and engage not just a younger audience, but also a persuadable audience. People who currently sit on the fence, right? They could move in either direction. Maybe they care about climate, but don't know enough. Maybe they don't care, but it wouldn't be too difficult with some really consolidated campaigns to push them towards maintaining the status quo. And there is a partner of, of ISD, an organization that I would really encourage everybody to go and research called DSMOG, uh, who do a lot of investigative journalism. And they researched over 100 influencers who are being paid by the fossil fuel industry since 2017. And that is all across the globe. So like India, Malaysia, the US, the UK. And they found that the follower account of those 100 people totaled nearly 60 million. So we're talking impressive organic reach, right? But then the combined reach of the content that they were creating on behalf of industry vastly outweighed that. Right? We're talking estimates in the billions for interactions and for impressions. And we know that in part because the PR agents who broker these relationships with the influencers are very keen to boast about these kinds of statistics, right? But in many cases, those influencers weren't disclosing their links to fossil fuel industry. So if you're just a user and you're browsing social media, you're looking at your news feed, you see something that looks kind of shiny, you'd have no idea that it's being paid for directly by Shell or BP or Total or Chevron, right? That had to be exposed through investigative journalism. And there are billions of posts going online every day. We're never going to be able to keep track. I wanted to give you a couple of examples because they sound so absurd, but I promise you I have seen all of these with my own eyes and I am not making them up. So we have a travel blogger, beautiful, totally Instagram ready, who is going on a scenic road trip with her husband and she's posting videos along the route. And it just so happens that her path partner is posing with a shell gas pump that is going to fuel their journey across the great American outback. We have a popular chef on Instagram making fish tacos with a gas stove and commenting that 
the flavor is just like that little bit better when you cook with gas and using the hashtag cooking with gas exclamation mark. You also have a former BBC presenter who launches a five part series on YouTube where they are interviewing fossil fuel company executives on the wonders of hydrogen. And they're saying to their Instagram audience, join the hydrogen powered adventure but not mentioning any sort of formal partnership with the companies. And then finally, you have a dad influencer. I'm sure many people here follow people like this, you know, talking about the challenges of raising children. It's funny content, it's relatable. And he's posing with his four children outside of a petrol station and exclaiming that this new BP lifestyle app really is gonna make my life. Now, in our own research from last year, so we have a COP unit that runs every year, we found that Chevron has a newly created TikTok account and that they had paid to boost 34 videos on TikTok. And they'd racked up about 188 million views for that content, right? 34 videos, 188 million views. I can barely get 10 likes on social media, so I consider that to be pretty impressive. And we estimated by you know, the metrics that are available that they probably spent just under $2 million to, to sponsor that content, which really is, is pocket money when you think about the windfall profits that these companies have had in recent years. And the majority of that content is trying to position companies as green champions, right? So they're talking about their innovation into biofuels and the amount they're investing in renewable energies and generally supporting green initiatives around the world. And at this point, in most presentations, somebody will usually ask me, isn't that a good thing? Don't, don't we want companies to do that? Don't we want companies to divest from fossil fuels and to be creating excitement and momentum around renewable energies? Isn't that massive progress from where we were 10 years ago? And that's a good question. But my response would be, if these actors were actually divesting from fossil fuels and driving our transition to a more sustainable future, then yeah, it would definitely be cause for celebration. I would be first, the front waving a flag saying, thank God we finally moved past uh, the kind of fossil fuel culture. But the reality is that the image that they are creating, the things that you see here, the things that Chevron will show you on its TikTok account, sit directly opposite to the realities of their business activity and also to their own investment plans over the next 10 to 30 years. I just wanted to give you a couple of examples of this. There was a, a Harvard University research paper in 2022, and it took 2,000 social media posts from some of the biggest European polluters. And in those posts, 72% of them were talking about the investment that they were making in green technology, just making sure I get the language right, 72%. But those same firms invested 1.7% of their capital expenditure annually in low carbon technologies from 2010 to 2018. 72% of their content, 1.7% of their investment. Another report, November 2023, so just before the last COP, um, the International Energy Agency, again, a respected entity that you would expect to give sober reflections on the industry, they showed, and it's here in this diagram, that the oil and gas sector is responsible for 1% of all worldwide investment into clean energy worldwide, despite what their advertising and their marketing and their influence campaigns are trying to show you. And that's why I, I'm really keen always to emphasize to people that that disparity is why we consider greenwashing to be information warfare why we consider it to be part of the mis and disinformation landscape and why it's misleading the public and then crucially why we need greater regulation going forward. And then the final thing that I will say on this group and it's here on this slide is that even Google results have become tampered with by industry and are being distorted due to fossil fuel money. 
We did another piece of research last year. If you go onto Google and you type in all of the neutral terms around climate change, climate, net zero, renewable energy, COP28, among the top things that it will show you will be sponsored industry advertising, as well as non-sponsored overt misinformation, which is nestled amongst credible climate science. So I want to close this final section or this bit on the fossil fuel industry by, by again asking you a question, which is, if we think that democratic dialogue is precious, and we also think that it's essential to achieving climate action, then do we really believe that this is a level playing field? Is this what democratic debate looks like? Okay. I promise you, we are gonna we are gonna end on a high. Everybody take a breath. So it's gonna get it's gonna get down before it goes up, but it's that's the roller coaster. So let's go back to this diagram. The next set of actors that I want to talk about are these ones on the right hand side here, who I would call stakeholders in the attention economy. And there are a lot of different types of people in this group, but I think they're united and driven by one core goal, which is that they want to harvest your engagement and they want to convert that engagement into a business model. So in the online space, they are constantly experimenting with their content, right? They're not like the fossil fuel industry. They're not disciplined. They're not sticking to a strict messaging calendar. There's a trial and error approach and they're experimenting with types of content and types of formats that are gonna get your likes and your clicks and your engagement and your retweets and your screenshots and your shares in your WhatsApp groups, right? And they know that if they can develop a strong enough follower base, then maybe their content will be monetized by the platforms. So every time you're on a YouTube video and you see an advert being shown, you know, like, God, this is so annoying. I just wanna watch my music video. Why is this advert being shown? The content creator is getting a slice of that revenue, right? That's what the advertising means. It might also mean that they can funnel people towards paid for platforms like Patreon or Substack, right? Where you, you pay to access greater content. Maybe they can sell you merchandise like a hat or a t-shirt, or maybe they can get paid speaking gigs on the international circuit, which I'm told is very lucrative if you're not in the NGO space. And I think, you know, I'm sure this won't come as a surprise to anybody sitting in this room, but a lot of these actors have tried to cultivate a brand, right, as being contrarians. They're countercultural, they're edgy, they're, they're polemicists, right? They're speaking truth to power, they're owning the libs, they're challenging the orthodoxy of these liberal thinking. The sheeple, wake up sheeple, do your own research, right? That's the kind of account that I'm talking about. And some of them have even started referring to themselves as the intellectual dark web. And I think that's such an, a funny title because we're talking about accounts that have tens of millions of followers, right? And that's absolutely central. They're some of the loudest voices in our public discourse, but they still present themselves as being outsiders. And What's really crucial when it comes to climate is that their engagement in this space is just completely opportunistic and quite often it's cynical and there is almost no attempt to engage with the substance of climate policies debates. There's no real critique of what the net zero transition looks like, what the Paris Agreement is. They just know that social media algorithms will reward the most divisive content and conspiratorial content and hateful content and that climate provides really good material. Now, I don't, look, I don't have a window into these people's brains, so I, I, who knows what they truly believe, and maybe some of them are absolutely convinced that climate action is a pretext for tyranny, and that the government plans to force feed you bugs, and that heat waves are geo-engineered by weather forecasters, and that wind turbines cause cancer, and that wildfires are started by climate activists or directed energy weapons, or indeed that the World Economic Forum plans to enslave you within walking distance of your home. Yes, those are all viral examples from the last two years. But I do think it would be fair to say 
that most of these people are playing what I would call engagement bingo, which means they're just throwing content grenades into social media and just seeing what blows up. And that, that's how these outrage merchants, right? These stakeholders in the outrage economy, that's how they game the system and they drag climate discourse down with them in the process. And if they were doing that, but they didn't have the right environment, then arguably it would just be another phenomenon in the online space. But unfortunately, social media platforms are not just enabling these actors, but they're actively encouraging these actors, right? Because the platforms themselves also rely on engagement because they need to sell advertising space. Your eyeballs are their product and they're a product for advertising companies in order to please their shareholders. And again, one example, COP26 in Glasgow, if anyone can remember that far back, we compared seven pages on Facebook that were known to spread mis or disinformation or were broadly climate skeptic with seven pages in Facebook's Climate Science Center. Show of hands, has anyone heard of or been on Facebook's Climate Science Center? One person, very interesting because Meta loves talking about its Climate Science Center to policymakers and to the media and to, and to civil society. And they say that it's a flagship product. It's part of their climate forward approach. And they partner with organizations like the World Meteorological Organization, for example, UNFCCC. So we compared the seven pages in that hub with these seven disinformation and misinformation pages. And we found that the latter group outperformed the verified pages by 12 times just during the course of the summit. So this is a period in time where users are most likely to be searching for information about climate, right? Pivotal moment in the year where some people who may never think about it are suddenly brought into this space. If you skip a year to COP27, and you went and you typed in climate, or even just CL into the search bar, then the very first result that would be given to you by autocomplete was hashtag climate scam, well above climate emergency and climate crisis. <laughs> and I have to say this because people say, well, isn't this a freak example? You just did it on one day. We have done it on multiple accounts with VPNs and agent user switches, deleting our browser history, making sure that this is as robust as possible. And we have done this for 18 months and the trend still persists, even though we have actively flagged it to the trust and safety team of the platform. And once again, this trend just relates to a tiny group of accounts. So while this content, it might lack an evidence base, but it doesn't lack an audience. And there are these unifying themes that sit under the content around state overreach and elite power. And they're, they're very often built on legitimate grievance. And I'm gonna come back to this at the end of the speech because I think it is so important for people in the climate movement to recognize this that COVID-19 turbocharged a lot of these phenomena, and it was for many a radicalizing moment. And it would be wrong to dismiss the very real trauma that people experienced during that time. I'm sure everybody in this room had the same experience. Overnight, we saw the realities of our lives completely change. And that provided evidence for people of what some of these things might look like in the future. And that's, that's what gives them the connective tissue, right? Is the reality of that period. And it's unfair to call people who might have received misinformation as extremists or radicals, right? They're not in, in, in every case. They are just fearful about the future. And there is a lot to be fearful about. And so this pushback on the woke agenda is constantly coming back to those themes. And it's a phrase that condemns everything from sort of gender identity to Black Lives Matter, to the climate crisis. So I'm gonna to come to my final set of actors and then thank God it's time for some solutions. Hostile state actors and far-right political movements. Now these actors quite deliberately on this diagram sit somewhere on the spectrum between the carbon and the outrage economies I've described. But 
what they share, as with all of these other actors, is a desire just to widen their audience, right? To reach the maximum number of people. What's really interesting in the case of pro-Kremlin propaganda, right? So Russian-sponsored propaganda, is that they actually have no consistent or coherent messaging on climate. We've looked into their influence networks online. Really what they're doing is they're constantly adapting their framing just in to reach a kind of particular geopolitical goal and ultimately serve their trade and their diplomatic agendas. So in the West, that mostly means seeding chaos, maximal chaos, and creating divisions and mistrust both within countries and between countries. So between the German government and the German people, but also between Germany and Poland or Germany and the UK. In Europe, and there are some examples on screen, we've seen them stoke fear among European citizens about renewable energies and saying that wind and solar, solar energy is going to you know, create an energy crisis and that people are going to freeze to death in their homes because we are pivoting our infrastructure to these technologies. At the same time, in the global south, they are celebrating those technologies, but only if they're funded by Russia or by Russia's allies, and that means usually China and Iran. The same kind of state-affiliated actors are also framing the Paris Agreement as a form of like neo-colonialism or part of the Western imperialist agenda, right? Desire to maintain these historical inequities. But they're also promoting the exploitation of natural resources in the global south Again, so long as those projects are funded for, by or benefit the Kremlin or the Chinese regime. So it's just a complete mix and match depending on what their geopolitical goals are. And at the same time, far right movements have also jumped on the bandwagon. So I wouldn't say that they're necessarily creating these ideas themselves, but they are opportunistically using them to galvanize voters and to galvanize the general public. The farmers' protests are a really good recent example of this. Arguably, they started in the Netherlands, but you now have them in Germany and in Ireland and in France, Spain and Poland. And they've offered a really clear point of entry into the news cycle and allowed these parties to create this image of hardworking people against a Brussels-based climate elite who care nothing about your future and who are willing to pursue climate action, whatever the cost. And, you know, I, again, I really want to emphasize because it's quite, you know, it's easy for me to be misquoted on this. If you believe climate mis and disinformation, that does not mean that you are an extremist. But there is radicalizing potential within the climate debate. And what happens when conspiracy theories become mainstreamed is that you get these more extremist movements who are able to use that moment to center much more violent agendas, right? And that's why you can get like neo-Nazi or white supremacist or fascist groups finding common cause with average social media users who would never have come into con contact with their posts or their ideas before, right? Because they're unified by these things in the news cycle, like the farmers' protests. And that is not a widespread trend. It's not a foregone conclusion, but it is a definite risk. And I really think that we need to be attuned to that risk. And that COVID-19 is a really good example of how that playbook, how that dynamic can translate into real world harm. And I wanna pause here just to come back to the, that democratic question. Right, we're on the cusp of the European parliamentary elections. I'm sure everybody is feeling a little bit apprehensive about them. I know that I am. And it is going to be a moment where you see how successful these far right parties are in weaponizing the climate agenda and using it to persuade certain demographics within Europe. Right. And like. Take all polls with a pinch of salt. Polls have led us astray for years. Don't trust the polls always. But the projections for June are really worrying for anybody who cares about democracy and anybody who cares about climate, right? The, the coalition of parties 
that looks set to hold the majority in the European Parliament, they have voted against climate action in almost every example in recent years, and that includes the flagship policies of the EU, the EU Green Deal, the Nature Restoration Law, etc. And they have no issue about inserting mis and disinformation into their campaigns. But at the same time, they also show just a general disregard for de democratic norms, right? Their, their goal seems to be to pull apart the very fabric of the European Union, which is a very messy and very complicated and very imperfect project, but is also a kind of extraordinary attempt at democracy at a grand scale, right? So these two things, again, inextricably linked, climate and democracy. And so I'm gonna close this section by coming back to that thought from the beginning, right? Is this just about delaying climate action? No, it's not anymore. Yes, they want to weaken public mandates. They want to legitimize fossil fuels. They want to maintain public subsidy. But that is only a narrow part of the equation, mainly for the fossil fuel lobby and for petrostates. And this wider objective is the one that has brought so many new actors into this space, right? The targets are not just climate action, but it's liberal democratic systems, and it's the very concept of international cooperation that is being challenged via this climate mis and disinformation. And so rather than confront the climate crisis together, it's just about pitting the global community against each other in often quite racist, quite xenophobic, quite fearful and hateful ways, right? Use the climate crisis as an excuse to turn inwards, to look at ourselves, to shut out the wider world. And I think if we're going to mount an effective response, which is where I'm sure you'll all be relieved to hear I'm coming to in a second, then we really have to be sober to the reality of these two different things, how they relate to each other. And we have to incorporate that into our communications going forward. Okay. I think everyone just, just, just shake out a little bit. Shake, breathe, laugh, cry. We come finally to what I hope is a more optimistic conclusion because I totally get it. Unpacking the threat landscape is really overwhelming and it's quite easy to believe that this is just unsolvable, right? There's so many actors at play now. There's so many perverse incentives, financial interests, personal interests. Believe me, I spend 23 out of 24 waking hours steeped in this space. And some days it does just feel really disheartening. But what I come back to is if we can confront the climate crisis and climate scientists tell me 100% we can, then tackling mis and disinformation has to be well within our grasp, right? It's nowhere near as big as the climate crisis. We just need to think smartly and effectively and strategically about it. And what that means is that we're going to have to think about regulatory approaches, right? Those big system level, top down things, but also softer approaches, incorporating climate considerations into tech policy or using science as the basis for digital literacy or having better forms of media scrutiny, like a whole wide range of things. And I could talk about this, honestly, for another 40 minutes, but I think you might all throw yourselves into the river. So I'm just gonna highlight two or three examples that I think, I mean, they give me hope, and I think they provide a really good framework of, of where we could go. So in the fossil fuel section earlier, we were looking at this kind of gulf that exists between companies' presentation, their public PR, and the realities of their business activity, right? Now that issue, that greenwashing issue, has now been championed by quite a lot of prominent public figures. I don't know whether any of you have seen quite vitriolic statements from Antonio Guterres, who's the Secretary General of the United Nations. And actually that momentum has been captured in new guides by the United Nations about more stringent criteria on what a net zero commitment actually has to contain in order to be credible. But, you know, the UN is very good at setting norms. It doesn't necessarily have great enforcement power, right? A lot of teeth to it. 
So the same agenda is also translating into these national and regional forms of, of, of legislation. And in the EU, that might be the, the Green Claims Directive or the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive. Uh, if there's anyone here from the US, the Federal Trade Commission is also updating its Green Claims Code. Uh, and in the UK, the, the Financial Services Authority has new sustainability disclosure requirements. So like lots of this sounds really dull to most people, but like this is where stuff happens, right? These are the nerdy, policy wonky places where people are actually held to account. And also, there's some really interesting stuff happening with advertising watchdogs who are sort of rising to the occasion in order to hold companies to account. I'll just give you one case study that in October 2022, the Advertising Standards Agency in the UK made HSBC Bank take down two of its adverts because they said that the campaign as a whole could mislead the public about how much of a green champion the bank was in reality. And there's been quite a few cases that have followed suit since with a similar precedent, right? Similar rationale at the heart. And this challenges that fossil fuel playbook I was talking about earlier, really at a systemic level, right? Because these adverts weren't being removed because they contained outright lies. They were being removed because the campaign as a whole might create a false impression and therefore pose a threat to kind of consumer safety and consumer understanding. That is a really smart pivot in the way that advertising standards are interacting with the fossil fuel lobby. Now that kind of scrutiny is really lacking in the online space. And that's where I would really encourage people in this room to kind of get, get informed and become part of this agenda because we know that the social media companies are making hundreds of millions of dollars every year from fossil fuel advertising, right? They allow those companies to advertise on their, on their services. And that's probably just the tip of the iceberg because their ad libraries are a mess and they make it almost impossible for us to actually quantify this activity at, at scale. And that's also true for, for like non paid for content, right? So this explosion of bots, networks and trolls and grassroots organizations, which are actually being orchestrated by lobbyists and trade associations. And if we don't have that transparency, then our democratic discourse is always going to be defined by the people with the biggest pockets, the deepest pockets and the most to lose. Right. So it might feel like it's outside of your wheelhouse. You know, I'm just a climate climate NGO. This tech regulation is not my field, but this is an agenda where the climate and the democratic safeguarding movements really do have to rise to the occasion and become part of this fight. And I don't know if any of you are aware of the Digital Services Act, but this is a radical new piece of, of um, regulation from the EU, which is, is really hoping to transform the game, right? It's hoping to open up the black box of social media and for the first time to make social media companies present about their systemic risks and to provide credible plans on how they're going to mitigate those risks, track those risks, report on those risks. And so what you can do, what everybody in this room can do is help to collate the evidence base that the policymakers need, right? Document how bad actors are weaponizing the online space and the digital commons and join coalitions. Don't do it alone. Join coalitions like we created for ourselves that spotlight particular aspects of this issue. You can also apply pressure on the companies directly on shareholders, dare I say. This is not something that I do, but I do think it's a, something worth considering, right? All of these companies, Meta and Google and Alphabet and TikTok, Amazon, right? They're all touting their commitments to net zero. They're all talking about how much they recycle and how much they're reducing their greenhouse gas emissions. Okay, fair enough. I don't have the, I'm not an expert to, enough to sort of assess those commitments. But if that is more than just lip service, then tackling mis- and disinformation should also be a complete no brainer for you, right? This should be part of your agenda. It hasn't been part of their agenda, 
And anything that they have done has kind of tinkered around the margins of the problem without actually tackling the root of the issue, which is why is it that polarizing content or misleading content is constantly rising to the surface? Why is it that that content is so often monetized? Why is it that they're happy to make money off of fossil fuel greenwashing? And why is it that attacks on climate policymakers and on scientists and on experts so often happens without any punitive action, right? It's happening without consequence. So use your voice to hold them to account and to make those, this kind of activity not only a reputational risk, but also a financial risk for them, right? So where, where do we close? We do need to make mis- and disinformation unprofitable, right? Both for platforms and for content creators. But you can't just tackle the supply side of the problem. You can't only view this as a supply side issue. There is also demand for misinformation. It's the diagram that I showed earlier about why misinformation thrives. And if you don't recognize that reality, you're never going to tackle this problem, right? I think it's really easy for us to blame all of society's ills on social media. Facebook broke democracy. Right? And like, I work for an organization that is constantly researching that problem. But people's issues with democracy are not just about information or even misinformation, right? There's fundamentally unequal and precarious times. And lots of people see very little in their future that inspires any sort of hope. And the climate movement has to confront that. And it has to make people at the front and center of communications. The partners that we have who work on the front lines, right, who are doing community outreach and strategic communications and campaigns and education, they all say the same thing, which is, if you can contextualize the climate crisis and bring it down from this really abstract top level problem to something that directly affects people and where they can see themselves, situate themselves within the transition, then people will support even really ambitious climate goals, right? And at the same time, if you can inoculate them to misinformation, so if you can kind of pre-warn them about the fossil fuel messaging or the conspiracy theories that they might see, then when they encounter them, they're actually much more likely to critique those ideas and to be resilient to those ideas. And one plea before, and then I, this is my final paragraph. If you're going to pre-bunk misinformation, please center accurate information and don't give extra oxygen to the falsehoods. This is a classic mistake that, that mainstream media make where they put the misinformation in the headline and then they don't debunk it until the body of the article. But how many people in this room only read the headline? No judgment, okay? All of the evidence says that everybody on social media is also doing the same. They're scrolling past the headlines, they're not reading the articles. So even a really well-meaning reporter can do a disinform disinformer's job for them, right? And if you only go away from this talk with one thing, let it be the truth sandwich. Has anyone ever heard of the truth sandwich before? Okay, so this is the idea that you start and you end every statement with the accurate information and you nestle the fact check in the middle by unpacking why and how it is false. So your bread is the accurate information and your meat or your salad, if you're vegetarian, is debunking the misinformation. And that, you know, seems like a small change, but it makes a really, really radical difference. And at the same time, always try and expose why people are spreading disinformation, right? What are the incentives? What's the rationale? Because this content isn't happening in a vacuum, but most of us just lack the context to really interrogate those political and ideological motives that are at play. We started with a story and I would like to finish with a story. I think our information ecosystems move so quickly that if you are trying to keep up with and to push back on every new viral conspiracy theory or 
trending lie, you are always going to feel on the back foot, right? It's going to feel like the game is just lost from the start. And sometimes there is a benefit to fact checking, right? We don't want to just let all of this circulate without any, uh, any counter information. But if you only ever train your lens really narrowly on what's on your phone screen, on the newsfeed, then you are going to miss the bigger picture and you are also going to lose that fight. I've been working on this topic at ISD for four years now, four and a half years. And I can say with confidence that even though this, the format might change slightly, the, the themes that lie at the heart of viral mis and disinformation on climate really don't change. And they are about who holds power in society, who has a seat at the table and how did they get there? And also about like our fundamental desire to be seen as people and to feel important in the course of events, to feel like we matter, even though we're just these tiny cogs in an enormous system. And democracies, they claim to do that. They claim to make every single voice matter. But the reality is the vast majority of people feel completely unheard and unseen by democratic systems. And the climate justice agenda says that it's going to redress that balance, it's going to make things more equal, to really decentralize power. But the goals of that movement are they're really intangible quite often. They're hard to pin down, they don't feel concrete. And so I will close my, my speech today with great thanks to International Idea and to all of the host organizations for inviting me with, with a plea, which is don't just defend liberal norms. Remake democratic norms, remake liberal norms so that they are truly leading to participation and inclusivity and engagement. Because if we want to tackle the climate crisis, and we believe that democracy is the best vehicle to get us there, then flooding the zone with good information is never going to be enough. Thank you.